Valinas, for those people who don't know his background, made a real impact in the fields of um, Middle East studies, uh, South Asian studies, Islamic studies at a very young age, soon after graduating um, with his doctorate from MIT. Um, uh, he is, in my view, sort of the leading authority in the world on political Islam in South Asia, and I think it was primarily for that reason that the Obama administration in its first term um, recruited Valley to work uh, with the, the, the late Ambassador Richard Holbrook. Um, in terms of students here that are interested in sort of, you know, the study of comparative politics, one of Valley's essays, uh, journal articles, that sticks out in my mind and it impacted me when I was a graduate student was this wonderful essay that he wrote on sectarian divisions in Pakistan that was published in, if I have it correct, the Journal of Comparative Politics in January 2000. And it was a wonderful, it was a wonderful sort of nuanced methodological sort of study of the topic that drew upon the literature and comparative politics and international relations. And if you're not interested in the subject, that article is worth looking at just in terms of a research design. And so I recommend that um, article to my uh, students. Um, less than a decade ago, Valley decided decided to pivot and to sort of shift his energy and attention and to make a contribution in terms of public intellectual life here in the United States and, um, and debates and contributions on, on policy uh, issues and, uh, and, and debates with respect to U.S. foreign policy. He's authored hundreds of important op-ed pieces, um, essays, um, 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 been interviewed extensively on the media, and has uh, authored a number of important books, several of them which are on sale outside. The Shia Revival, How Conflicts Within Islam Will Shape the Future, uh, The Rise of Islamic Capitalism, Why the New Muslim Middle Class is the Key to Defeating Extremism, Democracy in Iran, History and the Quest for Liberty, and he has a forthcoming book due out in April uh, with the provocative title, The Dispensable Nation. And if you read the New York Times, you'll see that Roger Cohen has given us a preview of the book, and it's going to cause, I think, a lot of debate because I think it's the first substantive critique of uh, U.S. foreign policy, um, um, Obama's um, foreign policy, by someone not on the Republican side of the debate, but from within the Democratic side of the uh, debate here in the United States. So that's a book that we're all looking forward to reading. I suspect Valley might have something to say about uh, um, those issues uh, in his talk today. And so just by conclusion, um, I often tell my students that, look, there's a lot of things that are published on a regular basis with respect to um, global affairs, with respect to the Middle East. It's tough to know who to read and who to spend your time on. Vali Nas is one person that when he writes something, it's worth stopping what you're doing, print off the op-ed, get his article, read his book and think and reflect on it. It will be a, um, an investment in um, your own education that will be worth uh, your time. And so um, we're really glad to have him here today. We're honored. Uh, the format is that he'll give us a, a lecture uh, on the topic, the Arab Spring. Where do we go from here? Ambassador Chris Hill will be the discussant. Um, I'll facilitate perhaps maybe a little bit of back and forth, then we'll go to the audience for Q&A. So without any further delay, please join me in welcoming to the Corbell School, Dean Valinas. Good afternoon. Uh, let me begin. Uh, first of all, thank you, um, Nader, for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. It's wonderful being here at the uh, Corbell School uh, for varieties of reasons. I have uh, no, go back with Nader and uh, Danny a long time, Nader since he was a graduate student, so I'm very pleased uh, now to be here and uh, uh, at, at an institution that he's so embedded in and has worked hard uh, in terms of developing not only its uh, core uh, capabilities on international relations, but particularly its focus on the Middle East, and with Danny, uh, uh, I've uh, known him and read his work on uh, the <clears throat> Green Movement in Iran. And Ambassador Hill, I first met when he was Deputy Secretary of State and was working uh, on North Korea, and then uh, when he was Ambassador in Iraq, and it's very good being here and meeting him again. And uh, I, have, uh, I work with uh, Secretary Albright in varieties of capacities, including as a fellow board member at the uh, um, National Democratic Institute. And she has made a point on having several conversations about the Corbell School. And I probably have learned more about the school from her and, and its history and its um, uh, 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 direction. So I, I will have something to tell her as well next time we meet that I have finally made it here. Uh, so it's very good to be here. Um, 
the Arab Spring uh, is, uh, uh, you know, started as a, a somewhat of a more simple idea, and it's becoming um, increasingly complicated and diffuse for us to put our hands around it. There, there's no question that it is probably one of the most significant uh, historical developments of our time, even though it is not very clear, it's not as crisp and black and white as the fall of the Berlin Wall or the transformations that we saw uh, in Asia after the fall of the Marcos government in the Philippines. But it is a significant development. It is the first time that there has been a seismic uh, uh, shift of this kind in that region. Whatever way we tally it, there are three dictators that are gone. Uh, there is a lot of uh, evidence that more may follow uh, soon. And then there has been a, a major transformation in the region, not in the direction that we thought, namely going from dictatorship in a very direct, unilinear way to democracy, but rather we're seeing a, a final crowning, if you would, of Islamic fundamentalism, which first came on the scene in 1979 in the form of the Iranian uh, revolution. Uh, we are still trying to grapple with you know, what happened. Uh, uh, you know, as is true of many other historical developments, uh, most observers of the region in academia, on the ground, in government, tend to miss it. And there are many reasons why that is the case. Uh, you know, you could look at these events as sort of black swan events that you know, su suddenly happen. It's difficult to predict them. We always may have thought that this day would come, but not, not uh, uh, at that particular in point in time. Many social scientists and many observers had, had, the, uh, 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 had the explanation early on that it is, uh, it is very obvious there was authoritarian fatigue in the region. You had dictatorships that had outlived their uh, popularity and legitimacy and were pushing it really by trying to create dynasties of putting their sons and family members on, on the throne. And, and ultimately, uh, what we saw really was uh, that the writ of history that we've seen in many other places eventually arrived at the, in, the, in the Middle East. Uh, this other argument that I've been put forward is more economic, and that is that the region has bad economics. There's no question that uh, it, in country after country, uh, the economy was dominated by big public sectors, dominated by the state. Some places there is enough oil money to be able to get around this inefficiency, but places where there was an oil, this meant that gr increasingly you had lower rates of growth and you had uh, very little engagement in the global economy. In fact, one of the distinctive things about the Middle East was not that it had so much Islam in it, that, that obviously, or so much religion in it, but one of the distinctive things about it was that it was the only really large area of the world that sat outside of globalization, that the globalization revolution didn't uh, arrive there. If you went back to uh, the period of 1990s to the middle 2000s, the combined non-oil exports of the Arab world equaled that of Finland. Uh, that's how little uh, trade existed. And you know, selling oil and buying airplanes and tanks is not globalization. It's trade, but it's not globalization. Globalization means that you produce many things that are bought by many different people, and you're part of the value chain of uh, economic productivity from the lowest end to the, to the highest end, the way we see in countries like Mexico or, or Korea or the Philippines and the like. And much of the Arab world was not part of this picture. And I think there's always a very simple test. If you went to Kmart and you don't find something made in the country, it's not part of globalization. <laughs> uh, and, and there are very few things you'll find at Kmart that is made in the Arab world. Uh, and, and, and that meant that the Arab world was not growing uh, at, a, at a sufficient rate, which means that the, re that the uh, income levels of the population, the GDP levels, the standards of living were increasingly declining. Now, to that you have to add something else, which is now uh, sort of the bane of the region, and that is a youth bulge. Now, we often associate youth with a positive terminology that uh, uh, the youth represents uh, forward-looking, represents new things, represents hope, democracy, 
but you know that's a that's a sort of a biased narrow view of the youth uh, you know thugs are also youth militias are also youth uh, you know uh, and in fact in the middle east everybody's young i mean the swing factor is really the old people about 40 uh, in a sense it's a very young society the implication is not whether they're pro authoritarian or pro democratic the more important thing is that they create instability period so uh, if you went to Middle East country after Middle East country, 60, 65% of the population are categorized as youth. And that means somewhere between from either 30 or 25 below, depending on how you count it. And there are areas in the Middle East that that number is just teenagers. And that makes for a very unstable population for varieties of reasons. One is that all societies with a youth bulge are uh, prone to political shifts. So, Virtually every civil war, democratic movement, and revolution of our time is associated with the youth bulge. Youth are risk takers. You know, uh, they don't like authority. They don't listen to authority. Uh, they're much more like they're much less bound and embedded in an economic system. They have a lot less to lose. And there are varieties of psychological, political reasons people associate with why youth push for political change. But there's also an economic reason. When you have so many, so much youth. You have to be able to provide them jobs. So, you know, a very flat demographic pyramid puts a lot of pressure on a political system. Uh, in the 1990s, when, when Algeria was going through a political uprising that ended up in a civil war, it was common to refer to the young, radical Islamist youth as people of the wall, Hittites, because that's all they did all day long. They were standing at walls, and they, they were essentially the father for. Uh, for uh, uh, militias and gangs. So the youth bulge was, a, was an important argument. Now, all of these things are true about the Middle, uh, Middle East. You know, it was too authoritarian, it, it, its economy was sluggish, and it had too many young people. But that doesn't explain why 2010, why not earlier or why not later, what happened at that time period that explains the uprising. So there's a, interesting external factors at play. One is technology. So there is very clear that technology played an important role in the Arab Spring. But I don't think in the way we think about it. So a lot of credit is given to social media, to Twitter and, and Facebook, and they did play an important role. But sometimes this role is misunderstood. And if you went back, for instance, to the Green Movement in Iran in 2009, uh, people gave a lot of credit to Twitter, but in reality, that was not true. I mean, most activists would say it was old-fashioned, old uh, um, you know, grassroots networking. In fact, Iranian cell phones did not carry data at that time, could not carry Twitter, unless you, you, know, you demonstrated during the day and then went home at night and tweeted about it. But this sort of running and tweeting scenario that people credited for, for crowd gathering was just not there. Uh, but fast forward to 2011, uh, Twitter and Facebook were a much bigger factor. But the real technological shift was not the arrival of the, of, of, uh, uh, the um, uh, Twitter and Facebook, it was rather the arrival of a smartphone and the telecommunication revolution in Arab countries that allowed smartphones to be used. So from loading of videos to, to Twitter to Facebook, required a different kind of a phone and a different kind of a telecommunication network. So arrival of 3G, 4G, et cetera, in the region proved to be critical. The second technological factor is a little bit older, and that was the, the satellite television network. Al Jazeera was far more important than Twitter. So you know, they played different roles. You know, social networking allowed for organization within countries. Al Jazeera made for the, the fire jumping over firewalls from country to country. So the demonstration effect and then the engagement in the, in the Western world was initially facilitated by, by Al Jazeera. The organization itself used, um, um, uh, <coughs> uh, used uh, the social media networks. The second external factor is, a, is, is an interesting one, which one which is likely to continue to play a role in this region and other one. And that was the issue of, of food security that brings in the larger question of water and climate and environment. Now, in the year before the uprising in Egypt, the, the price of wheat 
doubled because of global shortages and also changes in the patterns of production. And uh, in a country like Egypt, where 48% of the population lived under $2 and is extremely price sensitive, that was politically destabilizing. People initially came out in the streets in the year before the major Tahrir Square uprising, which was inspired by Tunisia, largely for, uh, for protests against food prices. There were over 1,000 uh, uh, you know, labor demonstrations in Egypt in the year leading up to uh, the Tahrir Square uprising. Now, this is interesting because it's, uh, it's where different discussions in global politics come together. A discussion which is an older one about the Middle East security political change and the newer one which is about the impact of climate on our world. And Arab Spring is one place where you know, these very different sets of issues came together. And the region continues to deal with these issues. I mean, drought is a big problem. Again, you know, if you looked at Syria, in the decade before Arab Spring, Syria went through the most severe droughts in its history, some say since biblical times, which disrupted rural urban economies in uh, significant ways. And uh, so, you know, there was the, the, the trigger of food prices and technology better explain why the break came at the juncture that we did. One other factor that, that is also critical for us to think about, and as we think about where Arab Spring goes and what we can do about it, is that it's true that bad economics was a critical factor, and that's the one that we intuitively, uh, you know, gravitate towards. I mean, it's, there's always a sort of a Les Miserables theory of, uh, you know, political change, that, uh, that, you know, the poor rise up because of injustice and, and, uh, and, and you know, political upheavals and revolutions are very simply always a, a variation of the French Revolution in some ways. But it's interesting to look that not all the news all the time was bad in Middle East economy, even though overall this region was static and, and, and losing ground economically. There were pockets of good news. So, you know, there are cases like Dubai and Turkey and uh, reforms here and there in um, Morocco. But one of the most interesting cases of actually economic success was Tunisia, where actually Arab Spring started. So Tunisia was very un-Arab when it came to economic matters. For much of the 1990s and most of the 2000s, it was growing at a rate of 7 to 9 percent. Um, when I was writing a book on middle class in the Middle East, people would say, you know, there's always Tunisia. Tunisia is the Middle East is China, uh, authoritarian and growing at tiger rates, East Asian rates. And yes, corruption, but you know, we overplay corruption at some level. China's corrupt too. And India's corrupt too, but that, and, 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 but that somehow does not preclude them from being members of the BRIC emerging market countries. And so Tunisia was corrupt, but uh, it was authoritarian, and, but it was growing very rapidly. And it was very un-Arab because also it was highly integrated into globalization. The Tunisians actually build things other people buy. Uh, Airbus industry built part of its fuselages in Tunisia. Tunisia was very well integrated into the tourism business. Tunisians manufacture textiles, varieties of things that are sold in Europe. Its middle class, by most accounts, was more than 50% of the population. Literacy rate in Tunisia is 80% plus, which is very on Arab again. When people say, when, when the Arab Spring happened, 80% of, sorry, 20% of Tunisians were on Facebook, which is a hot, much higher percentage of the population than in the United States. That's, that doesn't say something about Facebook. I don't think Facebook was even aware of that, of that fact before. It says something about Tunisia, because people are on Facebook in Tunisia, have internet access, are educated, are connected to the global culture and information systems. And therefore, it says something about the social strata in Tunisia. Now, iron the, ironically, this started in Tunisia. And uh, in, in some ways, it started in Tunisia because Tunisia was part of the global economy. Because when Europe took a downturn in 2008, uh, uh, Tunisia basically imported the economic malaise. 
So if you're disconnected from the global economy, there's positive sides to it too. Uh, is uh, is that you know you don't have problems? I remember you know people said that when the global financial crisis started, mo a lot of money in the Middle East went to Lebanon because Lebanon did not have any prime mortgage vulnerabilities. Uh, it was not part of the global financial uh, network. Whereas Tunisia was the, was the opposite. So so it, 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 in some ways it imported the economic crisis, and. Yes, there was a fruit seller who set himself on fire out of frustration, but that would have been a tree falling in the forest, was it not for the well-to-do, rich, educated, savvy, upwardly mobile Tunisian youth. It is they who captured the pictures, disseminated it, built a movement. It was not a revolution of the poor. It was a revolution of the middle class. It, it, and, and you know, good, good democratic revolutions are always middle class. If the lower class gets in, you end up in a dictatorship. It's always the case. Uh, and, and, and it was the right kind of a revolution in that sense. It was much more like what happened in Eastern Europe, in Latin America, and in East Asia. And even if you went to the next door country in Egypt, uh, you, most of Mubarak's period, the picture was what I described, lethargic, public sector dominated economies, except the last five, six years where he began to reform. And yes, there was cronyism, but you know, there was also cronyism in Indonesia under Suharto. All the businesses went to his sons-in-laws and, and generals. And in Tunisia, it went to the, uh, sorry, in Egypt, it went to uh, you know, the, the cronies of Mubarak's son. But in the last part of Mubarak's rule, uh, Egypt's economy was growing again at about seven to nine percent. And it did produce a new middle class in Egypt, which had ties to the global economy. So it's not, a, it's not a coincidence that the face of the Tahrir Square movement was a young executive at Google. There, there, there was a reason why, why, uh, why El al Qunim was, was at the forefront. And, and essentially, it's the middle class that really started this. It was the, it was the, is the, it was the change that started in the Arab world to catch up that, that uh, given the confluence of economic downturn, et cetera, uh, went, uh, created the problem. It's an important thing to keep in mind that it's the middle class and the private sector that would matter ultimately to the future. Now, you know, having said that, it's very difficult to be optimistic or, or hopeful about the Arab Spring right now. Although there are gains that are still important, you know, the, the Arab world did not have a public before, did not have a public sphere before. Uh, the, there has been a, a ground shift in uh, public attitude towards uh, authority. So, you know, Arabs believe now in the right to vote, in accountability, in social justice, in um, and the right to protest, maybe too much of it uh, at times. Uh, but, but in reality, you know, these are all new things for the Arab world. And, and that sense of empowerment that came from being able to bring down these dictators, particularly in Tunisia and in, and in uh, Egypt, were very important. Now, the, now the, the, the pro there's a problem with it, uh, 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 and that is that it's, it's directionless. Uh, but nevertheless, it's an, important, uh, it's an important gain that it's still out there. So beneath all this uh, war and civil war and uprising, there is still that kernel of belief in the values of the Arab Spring. And I think that's something to think uh, in, in going forward. But more than not now, we are facing challenges. And you know, that obviously reflects on, the, uh, uh, on our uh, foreign policy. One is you know, the Arab Spring, as I said, did empower the people. But it's a very unique revolution or democratic movement that is leaderless. So there's no Vaclav Havel here, there's no Nelson Mandela, there's no Khomeini, there's no Nasser here. It is truly a amorphous a grassroots uprising, and it hasn't produced a leader. And in fact, if you looked at cases like Egypt, somebody like President Morsi is desperately trying to become a leader, but he can't because he wasn't the leader of the revolution. He's become president of Egypt because he won in a very narrowly in a process that uh, legitimizes the leader. So his, his leadership doesn't come from the charisma of the movement or from having brought down uh, Mubarak, and therefore he has a very tough time imposing his will on, on, on the political process in Egypt. 
Now, that's bad because there is nobody to give this direction. There is nobody for the West to engage. There's nobody to, in the right way or the wrong way, to define what the next step is. The good part is that it's very difficult to crush it. So Morsi has a very difficult time uh, you know, having his way. Or in Syria, the reason that Assad could not crush the rebellion is that you can't crush a movement, a movement that has 100 different constituent parts and, uh, you, you, uh, and many more you know, permutations by village, by town. It's kind of a whack-a-mole game. You, know, you go here, and they, there's something somewhere else, and you go there. And also, there's nobody really to negotiate with. And, uh, and that's, that's a problem. In other words, uh, the, Arab, the, the, the amorphous, leaderless part was very good in confounding dictatorships and bringing them down. It's very bad at the next stage of how do you br build something new. The um, other very clear problem is that the guys that everybody hoped would win are not winning. Uh, and you know we should have we should have seen this. You know it happened in Russia with Karansky, it happened in Iran with you know the, the liberation movement and, and Bazargan. For those of you who remember or have read about it, uh, you know liberals are not organized. Uh, they they appeal to us better. We see them, but particularly in the Arab world, they didn't have political parties. They're not organized, and more than, more importantly, they really don't have a relationship with the population. So they, they, they are very effective at a moment in time, particularly in, in, uh, in capturing world news and bringing pressure on the government uh, and changing the calculus in a way that dictatorship would be vulnerable. But when it comes to game of voting, the game of numbers, they have no following. So take a country like Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood has been in every neighborhood providing preschool services, clinic services, cleaning sewers, financial services, giving micro loans. It's been on their side. It's been working in neighborhoods. In a poor neighborhood of Cairo, they know them. It's not just culturally or religiously. They know them. They trust them. They, they, they have been the de facto neighborhood government for a very long time. They have been the de facto uh, 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 you know, regional government in many, in many places. The liberals have no relationship with the, with the masses, and in fact, it would have been better for the liberals if Mubarak had not gone so fast, if they had had time to organize. It's the same if the Shah had not gone so fast, if they had time to build a party, to, to, to uh, create a different dynamic. Uh, but the reality is that, is that uh, they didn't, and the Muslim Brotherhood is very well positioned to take over. So the Arab Spring essentially has become a Muslim Brotherhood revolution. So from Tunisia to Libya, to uh, Syria, uh, to Yemen, what we are seeing is different shades of Islamist parties are, are taking over in a way that we didn't anticipate. And then the, 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 there are components in this we don't understand at all, which is the so-called Salafis, you know, the very puritanical side. Another thing that we don't understand at all is that Al-Qaeda has now become a political movement. Uh, you know, we sort of touted very early on how great was the Arab Spring. It was a defeat for uh, Al-Qaeda. I remember talking to some journalists on the ground in Libya who said, not so fast. You know, most of these guys uh, are, are Al-Qaeda, and they're no longer calling themselves Al-Qaeda. And they are much more sophisticated, and, uh, and, and they, are, they, they have much more of a sort of a Sinn Féin approach than, than an IRA provisional approach. And then we encountered this in Syria where the largest Al-Qaeda group is no longer called AQS, as we're familiar, but it's called the Victory Front, Jab al-Nusra. And it took a long time for us to recognize that and designate him as a terrorist organization. But this is a big challenge because, <clears throat> you know, the, the, we are sort of coming, we went from having a debate in Washington whether we should ever talk to the Muslim Brotherhood, and the answer early on was no to literally every American official going in the Middle East making a stop at the uh, Muslim Brotherhood headquarters, right? including at that point in time, Senator Kerry, who's now the Secretary of State. So, and then it's all really a game of hope. We hope that they will be pragmatic. We hope that they will look like Turkey, but we really, in reality, uh, you know, we have, no, we have no strategy of how to manage this beast or how to ride this tiger. And, and, and I think that's a, that's a big hole in our Middle East policy. 
Um, the, the third big issue is, is what we're seeing in Syria. So, you know, Middle East has some unfinished business. Boundary lines were drawn by, uh, by colonial powers. Uh, and, you know, the, 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 the division of power uh, has remained in many cases the same as it was when the colonial powers left. So the colonial powers left, leaving power in the hands of the Sunnis in Iraq, in the hands of the Sunnis in Bahrain, in the hands of uh, uh, Alawites in, in uh, Syria, and in the hands of the Christians slash the junior partnership of Sunnis in, uh, in Lebanon. Now, you know, Lebanon's last census was in 1932. Uh, uh, you know, actually, census is a very sensitive issue in the East. Nobody has interest in a census in the Middle East. Uh, but, but demography has changed in the time period. Those who are disenfranchised have become a lot larger, uh, and, and those who are ruling uh, are now sitting on top of a much more of a precarious uh, pyramid. And now we saw this happen in Iraq. In other words, we thought Iraq was about democracy. And as soon as we get in there, you give them the opportunity, the Iraqis are going to be debating civil rights, individual rights, you know, uh, rights of society, parliamentary rights. And we found out that actually they had other things they had to settle first, which is, is this country Shia or is it Sunni? And that people um, had secondary identities associated with the Iraqi that was important in their daily lives because it decided access to power and money. I always remember you know, talking to some a Shia Iraqi businessman who told, told me, oh, you're all wrong. We, we used to be all equal before the Americans came. And there was no such thing as Shia Sunni issue, and you're exaggerating. Okay, let's talk about something else. And then we, we, we continued the conversation, and they would say, well, you know, when Saddam was there, I couldn't get a loan. The loans only went to, to Sunnis. And I, you know, we, we couldn't do this because we weren't the right religion. So at the end of the conversation, so, so there was Shia Sunni issue after all. And, and you know, these issues were not resolved. In other words, who defines the identity of the country? Who gets the majority of the power? Who gets the shares of the spoils of the state? Who's the in and, and, and who's out? And, and these issues, we found out that once the dictatorship in the Middle East is not been suppressing individuals only, it's been suppressing uh, a resolution of this issue. So there are many parts of the Middle East that they say they have a national identity, but they really don't have a national citizenship. And these two things are very different. You know, we, we had that same thing. We had a, we had a definition of Americanness, but African, Ameri African Americans were American, but we didn't have a, a definition of a citizenship in which everybody had equal opportunity under the law until, you know, the Civil Rights Act and, and beyond that. So just to say that everybody's Iraqi or is everybody Syrian is a sort of a much higher level definition of identity, but these countries don't really have universal equitable citizenship. And, and, and so in Iraq, by removing the dictatorship, we opened this issue, and uh, now Arab Spring is doing to the Arab world what the U.S. military did to Iraq, essentially. So, and if you looked at the Arab world, when you go to the uh, Western part, countries like Tunisia and Egypt are generally homogenous. So they're more your Germanys of the Middle East. And as you go to the East, they increasingly look like Yugoslavia. Uh, and, uh, and, and therefore, you know, you have many different claims to power, although they're not as secessionist in that sense. But, you know, in countries like Iraq, we may get there at, at some point in time. I mean, the Kurds already want their own country, and one of the scenarios for Syria is that the Alawites will ultimately opt out, and in Lebanon, you know, the Christians are again, you know, talking about much more of a separate domain within Lebanon with their own access to the world, etc. So in some ways, you know, the Arab Spring, by definition, has to settle this issue, uh, and, and, and in, and in uh, Syria, it's becoming even bloodier than it became in Iraq, and there are big differences. In Iraq, there was a U.S. military to force a ceasefire at some point in time. So it was an op option of a surge and to prevent them from fighting, and then try to mediate the creation of a, of a government to actually, li literally, the United States helped mediate a political solution, which is, we, in this case, there is neither an outside military force to stop the fighting, nor is there any will, including in, in the United States, to help bring about 
a political settlement, uh, even if one was uh, easily achievable. So this is likely to continue. And uh, uh, in, in, again, in Lebanon next door, uh, you know, the issue, yes, Hezbollah is a terrorist organization. Yes, there is these issues cross-border with Israel. Yes, there is the Iranian hand. But at the end of the day, beneath it all, there is an unsettled numbers issue. So the Shiites are, by some accounts, 45% of the population. Even if you disagree with that, they believe there are a lot more than people think. Uh, but they only have 18% of the seats to the parliament, and none of the major offices of the state that go to minorities. Commander of the military presidency goes to Christians, and the prime ministership goes to the Sunnis. Now, Hezbollah has managed to muscle its way in to get more ministries than they would get under the constitution. So until that is settled, it's very difficult to settle the rest of the issues. Jordan, for instance, is a majority Palestinian country. I mean, Israeli far right would remind you of that uh, uh, quite often, which is ruled by a minority of East Jordanian tribesmen. Now, it so happens that a lot more of the Palestinians are Muslim Brotherhood also, and they have ties with Muslim Brotherhood in Hamas, in, in, in West Bank and, and Gaza uh, and, and in Egypt. And you know, across the Gulf, you have un unsettled issues. You know, Bahrain is three quarters or uh, two thirds Shia. It's ruled by a minority of um, of um, uh, Sunnis. Uh, you look at uh, um, Saudi Arabia; it's just a majority Sunni country, but the the minority, particularly minority Shia, which could be as much as ten percent of the population, does not have rights equivalent to ten percent of the population. So, you know, these issues have been brought to the fore. Now, you know, the U.S.'s probably vision of this region was built around 1980s and 90s based on a sense of a stable Arab world, you know, with Arab dictators that you could count on to control their own territory and also support U.S. policy, and, and a region that was not at war with itself, that you really didn't have to deal with the Balkan scenario there. Now, we are uh, dealing with the Middle East that doesn't have those powerful forces, a Mubarak, a, uh, a uh, uh, you know, strong Syrian ruler, et cetera, that would give you a sense of stability. But we're also dealing with, um, uh, with a, a, a ethnic chaos. My own sense is that, as happened with Yugoslavia, where Ambassador uh, Hill was engaged, that we, we can sort of wash our hands from it, with it for a while, but at some point in time, uh, it, it becomes uh, very difficult to do, but as time goes by, it's going to be more and more difficult to wrap this up. And I think the, the debate right now is whether this is a humanitarian crisis or not. But I think you know we have a lot more at stake in Syria than we like to admit publicly. So the debate is that, is this Rwanda or is it Bosnia? Uh, and we tend to keep saying this Rwanda, you know, we'll apologize at some point for neglect. We really don't need to get involved. Uh, or where is Bosnia that at some point you think that, you know, it really does uh, hurt you. Um, I, so I think that's, that's what we were grappling with. Um, finally, the other important factor is that this, this uh, issue started because of economics, good economics, bad economics. Economics still the problem in this region at two levels. One is that uh, you know, the Middle East was already not doing very well when it was stable. You had too many young people without jobs, getting frustrated. I think we all have forgotten the narratives of post 9-11 we used to hear every day on television. Uh, and then uh, now, you, now even that minimal economic activity is not there. So Egypt's GDP has been shrinking. Its, it's tourism industry has collapsed. Uh, there are no jobs. The direct foreign investment is leaving. Um, so, you know, the, the economic scenario is quite dire. And uh, I have to say, there is no real outside engagement. The other side of it is that even if there was economic stability, we don't have a single case of successful democratization that doesn't involve economic restructuring and the IMF. And if you compared uh, the Western world's engagement um, United States, Europe, IMF, with Poland, with Philippines, with uh, Argentina, with Brazil, and then compare it with the Arab world, it is at some level shocking. 
So, you know, in, in a 10-year ti time period between 89 and 99, the Western world put $100 billion into Eastern Europe. Uh, and that is 1989-99 dollars. Our sum total of commitment to the Arab world really is zero. We haven't given anything other than military aid and minimal amount of development aid that, that was there before. When Mexico was going through a uh, transformation, uh, the, the US Treasury, Goldman Sachs, and IMF in one swoop put in $40 billion into the Mexican economy. And this wasn't free money, like the way we used to it. Was a, it was in exchange for changing their currency, trade laws, investment laws, uh, privatization, completely overhauling their economies. I mean, the kind of thing we're telling Greece and Spain to do, or not us, the Europeans are telling them. And no, of course, nobody likes doing it. But you know, conceive of the level of engagement that exists in getting these countries to do the right thing, kicking and screaming even, to do the right thing. And, and I think the problem for us is we were perfectly willing to spend $2 trillion on this region to change it. But when the opportunity for real change came about, we are not willing to engage. And I obviously understand there's a lot to do at home, et cetera, but the reality is that uh, just because of the economic issues at home, the foreign policy problems are not gonna go away. And, and, the, and the, all the signals for this region are, are very negative unless, uh, you know, the, the particularly the economic story begins to change in a, in a uh, better direction. So, you know, there is, I think, need for some serious thinking about what is our game plan with this region? What are our objectives? Where do we want, you know, key countries to be in five years' time and how, how we're going to do it? My hope is that, you know, with a new Secretary of State, a new um, uh, a set of people uh, and a fresh start, that, that we would, we would take uh, uh, the, both the opportunity and the threat of the Arab Spring seriously. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Well, I thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, so much wisdom and so little time. Um, I mean, I think uh, that was as comprehensive a view of the Arab Spring as one could ever see, the discussion of authoritarian fatigue, the, the issue of youth bulge, the, the middle class nature of some of the, the start of some of this, the failure of liberals, however, to consolidate these revolutions or even uh, uh, much less take, uh, take control of them. And then um, the issue that I think uh, greatly interests me as someone who spent a lot of time in Iraq is this issue of identity. And uh, in particular, the, the Shia and, uh, and Sunni identity and what role that plays in this, uh, in this uh, political context. You know, I once uh, visited with, the, with Sultan Qaboos in, uh, in um, uh, Oman Muscat and the Sultan, who was sitting there with a dagger in his uh, sash, who was seen right out of the New Yorker magazine or something. Uh, and uh, Sultan, <laughs> I was trying to get a handle on some of these issues. And he said, you know, you Americans, you just talk about politics all the time. It's not all about politics. There are much deeper trends here. And uh, the Shia Sunni issue is not just a political issue. It's a uh, it's very, very deeply, a very deeply felt religious issue. And he said, you Americans, you don't like to hear about that, but that's part of it. And then he made the point that the Shia world is actually growing at the expense of the Sunni world, and this is very troubling to, to Sunnis. And I said, are, why are they growing? Is it because of, he said, stop thinking politics. This is not about politics. You know, what, is, what about the liturgy of the Shia uh, uh, faith that is more appealing. He said it's a lot of different things. So I would, um, I'd like to maybe uh, see if you can talk a little more about the Shia-Sunni, I won't call it a divide, but I would call it a dichotomy. Um, I'd like in that context to get a better sense too of the role that Iran 
plays in the Arab world? I mean, are there limits to how much an Iran can really play in this kind of these um, tectonic shifts among Sunni Arabs and Shia Arabs? Is the discussion of Iran on the part of the Saudis a kind of uh, exaggeration, really, or a kind of sort of Iranian boogeyman? You know, oh, you Americans, you don't know what you've done. You've put this uh, Iranian uh, uh, surrogate in power in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Iraq, et cetera. I mean, is, is Iran being kind of used in this sense, or are there organic links? I mean, how, how much do we need to think about Iran and its, its efforts in the, in the Levant? I mean, how, I mean, are, is Hezbollah going to be a, or is it a pro-Iranian, uh, is it a, an Iranian relationship? Is it a Shia relationship? Anyway, a little, little more discussion about that I would find very interesting. And finally, um, you know, I've heard a lot of people say that uh, Syria is like Bosnia. Uh, and why is Syria like Bosnia? Because there is so much civilian carnage, it is very reminiscent. And you made the uh, comment about uh, Rwanda that maybe we'll just kind of ignore it all and apologize later. Uh, but I think there's one really big difference between Syria and Bosnia. And I speak as someone who uh, has a few scars to show on the uh, for my efforts in, in Bosnia. And the, the big difference to me, and I'd be interested in your comments, is you know we looked at the situation in Bosnia and we realized that Serbs, Croats, Muslims are now called Bosniaks, they're going to need political arrangements where people feel comfortable. And just saying, oh, wait a minute, we got the uh, Helsinki Final Act. Everyone signs on to the Helsinki Final Act and everyone's gonna be fine. Well, no one believes that. No one believed that. So what we ended up doing, of course, was to put together uh, uh, a new constitution with a concepts of, uh, of uh, autonomy, both uh, autonomy in a territorial sense, but also there was a sort of ethnic autonomy as well. Serbs are entitled to this. Um, um, Croats are entitled to that. We'll do kind of rotating stuff there to make sure that everyone has a concept of being part of the state and that therefore, you know, once we fi finally got rid of all this stuff, and by the way, NGOs after we did this had a, had a, a lot of fun saying, you know, what were they smoking in Dayton? Um, <laughs> that they came up with all this stuff and the answer was, look, if we could get the three parties to agree on what to call it, let's say they wanted to call it the Grand Duchy of uh, Bosnia, that would have been fine with us. It was a question of what we could get people to agree on, and that's why some of the structures looked complicated. But I guess what bothers me about the whole Syrian issue is we are plagued by questions of should we be arming the rebels? Which rebels should we be arming? Are they really rebels? I mean, what are they, et cetera? You know, questions, sort of tactical questions like that. But I guess my question would be, to what end? Whereas in, in Bosnia, early on, you know, uh, 15 months, 16 months before Dayton, we had something called the contact group plan. We knew precisely what the political arrangements, even down to the size of the territories with the internal boundaries, within Bosnia, and yet I don't see any effort to, to work on, in, on political arrangements. Because the advantage of political arrangements is you then say, do you really want to be the last person to die in the stupid war where you already know what your territory is going to be? Why would you want to die for something that's already been determined? So anyway, maybe some comments on the Syrian situation. And I certainly didn't mean to monopolize this because I don't know about the rest of you, but this is one of the best presentations I've ever heard. And I know you're going to have a lot of questions. So thank you. Um, first on Syria, I think your point is very well taken. And, uh, and, and lack of a sort of a grand vision of where do we want to go rather than uh, how we want to play this tactically, I think is, is very, is very appropriate. Because even if we arm the rebels, uh, either they win and we have to confront this scenario anyways, uh, or that you end up uh, creating a, a sort of a seesaw situation between relatively equal sized forces that then will be fighting for a very long time. Um, on the Shia Sunni issue, I think you, you're absolutely right. There is a, there is a, um, 
in religious difference uh, between these two, um, much as I would say is between Orthodox and Catholics or Protestants and Catholics, that you know, there is a belief overall in Christianity vis-a-vis -vis other religions, but there is a disagreement about uh, law, theology, uh, and, and, and most importantly, history. So, you know, Shiites Shiite and Sunnis differ over who succeeded the prophet. Uh, the Sunnis think it's much more like the way Vatican's gonna choose the next pope. You know, there's a group of, you know, uh, uh, com representatives of the true faith will choose the best among them, and then the charisma of leadership is invested on, on that person. Whereas uh, for the Shiites, it's much more like the plot of the Da Vinci Code. It's all about uh, blood and, uh, and primogeniture. But you know, from that coming forward, they, they, they disagree on matters of law. And you're in, in Islam, law matters. You're not a Muslim by faith. Uh, you're a Muslim by practice. And practice, like Judaism, is governed by the law. And there's difference in law. So commercial law, inheritance law, laws surrounding women, varieties of things, Shias and Sunnis uh, differ. It might look minor to us uh, from a distance, but closer to them, it really defines how they are. I mean, how you stand in prayer are different. I remember a journalist in Iraq told me he went and uh, uh, met this uh, Sunni politician, Ashadani, and uh, he gave him a long lecture about um, the fact that he's not sectarian, he's Iraqi. But this uh, journalist had Arab ancestry. So the next question Mashtani's asked him is that, well, how do you stand in prayer? Which is the other way of asking, are you a Shiite or Sunni? Do you hold your hands in front of you or, or to your sides? And, and those matter, uh, I think, uh, very much. Um, but the reality is that Middle East as a whole has become much more Islamic since 1979. And therefore, the question of what sort of Islam do you practice is very important, and particularly among Sunni fundamentalists, uh, you know, pure practice of faith is very important. Who's a nominal Muslim and who's a real Muslim? And you, when you get to Salafis, they don't even think uh, most Sunnis are Muslims, let alone uh, Shiites. And, uh, and therefore, this, becomes a, uh, this has become more of an issue. But you know, there is a point at which you know, identity and politics, et cetera, also uh, converge. So if there are everyday social prejudices uh, about uh, whether you can enroll at a school or buy a property here or you can get a job uh, or there are sort of ways in which you're referred to in a derogatory way, you know, they be begin to sort of reinforce an identity. For instance, uh, Shiites in Lebanon, particularly after the 2006 war, began to take, take, refer to one another the, uh, with, a, with a very derogatory term Sunnis use to refer to Shias as Metvalli, which is equivalent of using the N-word in English. But you know, that sort of gives them a sense of identity as to who they are, but they sort of absorb it as a badge of, badge of honor. And uh, so there is a sort of intersection here. And then, as you mentioned, it does intersect with a much larger regional politics. So if you consider Turkey sees itself as the heir to the Ottoman Empire, which was the seat of the Sunni Caliphate, uh, and even the current political party in Turkey is a self-consciously Sunni party, uh, even though a moderate one, etc. But its relationship is, is, a, is a, to religion is very much of a moderated Sunni fundamentalism. Uh, Iran has a, um, you know, a Shia theocracy, uh, and then you know, Saudi Arabia for a very long time has anchored its foreign policy in leadership of the Islamic world. So the king of Saudi Arabia has the title of the protector of the two holy sites. That's part of his claim to being more than a head of state and to be really having an Islamic world credential. So you know, religion matters to the posturing of these countries. And uh, there is a rivalry, healthy rivalry, about uh, who is the rightful spokesman for the Muslim world. Turkey is a new entrant in this debate, but Iran and Saudi Arabia have been going at it since the 1980s. The Iranians don't like to talk about the Shia Sunni issue. Because if you're Persian and you're Shia, you're in the margins. It's much better for them to talk about generally Islamic issues, and then also focus on secular Islamic issues, which is anti-Americanism and anti-Israeli politics. 
Whereas Saudi Arabia clearly has an advantage of focusing on the Shia Sunni issue because it knows it's an Iranian handicap. The more you emphasize that, uh, you know, that, that I the Iranian ayatollahs are, an, uh, are sort of a co-exotic phenomenon in the Muslim world. I, I remember Muammar Gaddafi in 1979 said, what is this thing I, uh, called ayatollah that Iran has 82 of and we have none? Uh, uh, but, but it was uh, 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 sort of underscoring an Iranian exceptionalism, if you would, of this idea of a, of a political leadership that you know, was alien, alien to them. I think you know, th this is also obviously playing out, in, as the Sultan of Oman said, in very complicated ways. That is difficult for us to put our hands around it. So it's about faith, it's about identity, it's about politics, and then it's both local politics and, and, and international politics. I think the Saudis do overemphasize uh, Iranian role in Lebanon and, and, uh, and, and Iraq, largely because they um, underemphasize their own role there. So, you know, we don't talk about Saudi role in uh, Lebanon or Saudi role in in Iraq or Saudi or in Syria. And whenever you're doing the Arab world, they say, well, but you know, they're Arabs, they're one family, whereas Iranians are the outsiders. They're sort of, they have no right to meddle. We have a right to meddle. I remember one Arab ambassador told me that Iran has given us a concession that it will not meddle in the choice of the next Lebanese president. And then the next sentence was that, but that's a high assumption that they had any role to play in the first place. Uh, uh, but, um, so, so that's one element. The other one is that I think Arab Shias identify with Iran, and Iranians identify with Arab Shias, but the only reason that they are sticking together is because the Sunnis force them to stick together. So take the two cases of Iraq and Bahrain and how Saudi Arabia played it. <clears throat> so in Iraq, the Saudis made a point of humiliating the Iraqi prime minister. Uh, you know, ref the king of Saudi Arabia refused to meet him because somehow Maliki had uh, not kept his word or was violating human rights in, 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 in Iraq. Um, or, um, uh, you know, the, the Arab countries were the last to open embassies uh, in Iraq after Turkey and, and Iran. Just this year, it was last year, Iraq tried to hold uh, an Arab summit, the Arab League summit, and you know, many of these, its neighbors sent very low level representatives to that meeting. And, and there was a sense in Iraq that the escalation in Al-Qaeda bombings was designed to actually derail Iraq's attempt to be Arab. So when the Shias actually tried to be an Ar Arabs, instead of embracing them, uh, they, they actually tried to make a point of, no, you're not an Arab, end of the day. I remember a Saudi de uh, deputy foreign minister told me when I visited there, I, and I had, because of my book, The Shia Revival, he said in a very arrogant way, can you explain to me why Iraqis are, are uh, traitors to the Arab cause? So I said to him, treat them like Arabs and they will be Arabs. Uh, or look at the case of Bahrain. You know, this was an uprising that at least on the surface was democratic or for social justice, et cetera. The Saudis made clear that this is all about Shiism and Iran, and it should be treated as a outside interference in an Arab issue. So basically, uh, the, the Saudis anointed Iran as having played a very important role in this. So if you're a, Le if you're a Iraqi Shia or you're a Bahraini Shia and you look around you, and you say that the only price for being an Arab is to assume subservience or deny your identity, um, you look to the one country that is willing to give you money and, and, and support. The way to get Iraqi Shias to uh, divorce Iran is not by threatening them, is by making them feel comfortable being Arabs. Uh, then, you know, I'm sure that all the issues will come out you know, end of the day, you know, they, they are the same faith, but they're as different as, you know, Polish and Italian Catholics are. And, uh, and I think that's, that's, that's a, an important point to keep in mind. Do you have some questions? Sure, please. The floor is open for a few questions.
Yeah, right there. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Daniel Latham. I'm a first year security student here. And, um, thank you for the wonderful discussion. And, uh, I'm actually, I actually did my undergrad at Tufts University. Huh? Uh, uh, hello, John. I'm giving your yeah. lectures back there. It's a pleasure to be speaking here. You mentioned uh, Turkey a few times in your remarks. Uh, I was wondering uh, what role you thought Turkey might have to play, perhaps as, uh, as a source or conduit for the kind of investment and resources and, and, uh, and leadership that the Arab world has been lacking, and, and <coughs> what role it might have to play. Yeah, well, I mean, Turkey has a big role to play, and there are a lot of Turkish businesses, and there's a Turkish model, but Turkey by itself does not have the capacity to do what the region needs. I mean, Turkey is not Germany vis-a-vis -vis Poland. It doesn't have the market, the resources. They, Turkey, and same with Qatar, same with Saudi Arabia. I mean, they can be part of a, of a broader economic effort in the region, but th this requires American leadership and IMF leadership. Um, and then, you know, you could, you could bring them on to, to play that role. Alan? I really appreciated your remarks. I enjoyed particularly your remark about borrowing. Um, I want to ask you a question, however, about this. It seems to me that a lot of what America does is counterproductive. For example, I would say that the invasion of Iraq and a lot of the occupation did nothing to further peace in Iraq without counterproductive and simply as aggression. And it also seems to me that the question you raised about all, or all the aid dictatorships previously is actually morally treated. You can speak about it in terms of stability around here, but frankly, we gave, what, $30 billion of aid to Mubarak? I think you raise a brilliant point about the contradiction between all that we did and all that we aid we came up with in Mexico. And the little aid we felt from the Middle East. But as a qualification, isn't it the case that the US has continued its military aid to Egypt <laughs> and has played a huge role in Egypt? And it seems to me a way of putting this question would be this um, what would shake us out of our lethargy about this going on with certain <laughs> kinds of intervention in the area? and actually get us to contribute significantly exactly the way we raise the contribution between Mexico and there. Well, on the other line of that, you could even say, gee whiz, isn't the oil here important? Don't we have a big interest there? So what is it that is preventing us from thinking of new ways? Well, you know, uh, uh, the Iraq war, we could say, uh, was was a misguided enterprise of invading that country, and and we have to do the best with dealing with its aftermath. Um, and 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 in terms of support of dictatorship, in the long run, obviously, it was a wrong policy. And um, although the logic of it then was clear, because you know you 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 relying on people to enforce stability in the short run, and support your policies in the short run, but it didn't wouldn't work in the long run. But, you know, I, I think important thing for the, for the Americans is not to litigate the past. Because you can, we can get at the end up in these historical debates is important. But there is, a, there is a house burning there. And that requires us to sort of not get into saying, well, because you did that in the past, um, you know, um, there's, a, there's a verdict here. So we can agree on that. That has to be judged, and historians will do it. But that we have to see what is the issue here. So yes, we're giving money to the Egyptian military, but that's not, uh, first of all, it's a drop in the bucket for Egypt. Secondly, it's in the wrong place. And thirdly, it's not the kind of IMF money that we were talking about. I mean, IMF money, these packages, like the one you're giving Greece, is not money that you're just giving. It's a, it's a, it's a deal. You get this if you do X. And you get this if you do Y. That kind of a give and take and conversation is not happening with Egypt. Of course, the Egyptians don't want to do it. But nobody's really engaging the Egyptian people the way European leaders engage uh, uh, them. So we have to see, and, and your point is absolutely right. The conversation in the United States is we don't need the Middle East because we've got plenty of gas and oil now, right? Uh, which is, I think, is a very myopic or narrow way of thinking about this. 
And, and secondly is that this is all about, wouldn't it be nice to help them? Or wouldn't it be nice to stop Syrians from dying? That's the wrong way of looking at this. Because this is all in the realm of philanthropy and, and humanitarian effort, as opposed to saying, really, what is our national interest here? So what, what do we have at stake? And if what we have at stake important or serious enough that we need to do something about it, and if, if that's the case, what is that something and how do we do about it? And that last conversation is not there. So the media is at one level saying, well, we really don't have a need for the Middle East anymore. We need to go to China. Uh, on the other level, that you have these people in the media are saying, you know, it is, it is abhorrent that we're allowing 70,000 Syrians die, but nobody, neither the administration, nobody in the public, is actually making a case that why is this a vital national interest for the United States? Why standing Egypt on its feet is, as in, is more important than standing Greece on its feet? I mean, you could make that case that, okay, if Greece got out of EU, the world may not fall apart. I mean, Euro might, but, but, but if Egypt really tanked, uh, it could be much more dangerous. And until you have that conversation or that argument made, and ultimately, my opinion, that argument has to be made by the government of the United States. That's the one that has to convince the American people why Egypt matters the same way as, you know, Chancellor Merkel, day in, day out, has to convince the Germans why they need to care about Greece. If, if she didn't speak, Believe me, it would have been over by now. Let's take one last question. You're right there. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nasser, for very deep uh, information about the Middle East. But I believe you uh, did not touch really the issue of India. So I've been mm -hmm. reading about this, and some of the uh, political scientists believe that this is pretty much fairly state and it was created by Italy as a part of the Italian colony. And they are basically Sunni and the war which goes between inside this uh, media during this that era was just the tribal wars. So I would like to know your uh, ideas about India in its future and during the that period when the war started. Well, I, I don't claim close expertise on Libya, and I think largely because it was such a close country for a long time, we really don't know enough about it. We didn't have an embassy for generations, you know, we didn't have interactions with it, and there are not many people who focused on Libya. Yes, there are tribal divisions, and uh, Libya is in many ways a failed state. It has oil money, but uh, you know there was very little institutions of state that Gaddafi built. There was hardly any national army or national police or a national bureaucracy, and what existed was shattered during the uprising and then in, in, in the aftermath. You know, one of the things that is particular about the Middle East, and maybe it's different from the case of Yugoslavia and Bosnia, is that there is a sort of a schizophrenia about these issues. In other words, there is enough of a residual loyalty to the state. So nobody's actually a secessionist, other than the Kurds who are not Arabs. So nobody actually proactively wants a South Sudan, at least at this point in time. But nobody can live together either. Right? So there is, not, there is not that definition of a citizenship there either. So you have this uh, complicated issue of having real sort of a civil war scenario that could potentially uh, create a breakup scenario. But at the same time, there is no clear subnationalism. So there is no equivalent of Bosnian or you know, Serbs saying, this is our identity. We really don't want to live with them, and we want out. And these are the boundaries. Um, and that actually makes for a prolonged, if you would, crisis uh, going on. So if you really don't want to get involved in Syria, you stick with you know, uh, uh, narrative A, which is they're all Libyans. They really love their country. Everybody identifies with Libya. They'll sort it out. If you really want to be worried about what continuous failure and breakup in, Syria might mean, in Libya might mean, you have to sort of pay attention that, that, that these divisions do exist. And I have to say, the, 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 the fact that people on the ground, and this is true of Iraq as well, have not really figured it out doesn't help us. So on Mondays, they're Shiites and Sunnis or Benghazians or Tripolians. And on Tuesdays, they're all 
you know, Iraqis or, or Libyans. So if the minute you talk about, like, you know, uh, then Senator Biden and Les Gelb did about a division of Iraq, everybody bristled. How dare America talk about breakup of Iraq? But then the biden Les Gelb map was actually used by some Iraqi parties six months down the road uh, as, as a possible uh, you know, scenario for, for, for Iraq. Um, so, so yes, I think Libya is in danger in many ways. It is in danger of a breakup, but it's in danger of being a, fa a very rich failed state um, and becoming a source of a great deal of headaches uh, for its neighbors and in the region. And already, you know, what's happening in Mali and, and in Nigeria, et cetera, has to do with, with sort of blowbacks uh, uh, out, of, out of Libya. Thank you. Okay. Please join me in thanking Bali Nas for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great pleasure.